Again, good afternoon and welcome to the Association of the United States Army's General Gordon R. Sullivan Conference and Events Center. I'm Pat McQuistian. I'm a Vice President for Membership and Meetings here at AUSA. And on behalf of our President and CEO, General Carter Hamm, and all of us at AUSA, we are deeply honored to host this important forum. General Hamm sincerely regrets that he couldn't be here today. As an infantry soldier who served 37 years in uniform from the rank of private to four-star general, this is a topic he believes to be among the most important issues for study and action. We thank everyone for being here today, and we know it took some extra effort on your part as we had to reschedule this from last month due to weather. AUSA's Institute of Land Warfare has coordinated this presentation today as part of our mission of education, dissemination of professional knowledge, and promotion of the efficiencies of the armed forces of our country. We know the task force's mission is supremely joint, and we recognize members of all the services participating in this important work, as well as Special Operations Command, the National Guard Bureau, the Department of Defense, and the Joint Staff. As part of AUSA's supporting efforts, our Institute of Land Warfare has produced a spotlight publication that describes the purpose, scope, mission, and desired outcomes of the Secretary of Defense's Close Combat Lethality Task Force. Copies of this publication are available in the adjacent room. We hope you'll take them with you, and Dan Roper, if you'll stand up. Dan is the author of this paper, and I'm sure he's very interested in any feedback that you might have. Thank you, Dan. We are live streaming this session, and access to the live stream can be found on our website at www.ausa.org live. We know that at least 27 people confirmed their plan to attend virtually today. For their benefit, we'll ask the audience to use microphones that we'll pass around for the question and answer period. Please be thinking of the questions you'd like to address at the conclusion of the remarks. We also welcome members of the press that are here with us today. For all participants, please note, we are on record and for attribution. We have two very distinguished speakers here today. You'll find biographies of both in your program, so I'll briefly introduce them. <coughs> Mr. Robert Wilkie is concurrently serving as the Acting Secretary of Veterans Affairs and Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. The son of an Army officer with his own service in the Air Force, Navy, and Department of Defense, Mr. Wilkie is responsible for the work of the Close Combat Lethality Task Force. Dr. Robert Scales is a retired Army general, decorated combat veteran, prolific author, educator, and military analyst. He also serves as the chair of the task force's board of advisors. He will present a historical perspective, and then Mr. Wilkie will present a keynote address. So it's my honor at this point in time to turn the floor over to Dr. Scales. Thank you, General McQuistian, and uh, to AUSA for inviting uh, Mr. Wilkie and I to talk to you today. I'll be brief with my introduction, and my purpose is to give you a sort of historical background for this enterprise, where it came from, uh, and uh, particularly the relationship of uh, this enterprise to our Secretary of Defense. Um, Mr. Wilkie and I are committed to implementing Secretary Mattis's intent to make close combat units dominant on tomorrow's battlefield, to achieve what the Secretary calls overmatch against all of our future enemies. This effort, if I could leave one message with you, this effort is important to the Secretary. He's been involved personally for over five decades uh, in active campaigns to create superbly performing Army, Marine, and Special Forces infantry small units. In 2004, I joined Secretary Mattis in his reform efforts. After commanding the 1st Marine Infantry Division in Fallujah, he was appointed as commander of the Marine Combat Developments Command. It was there that we started collaborating on a program inside the Marine Corps to achieve small unit overmatch. As one MEF commander in Iraq, he successfully put many of our, our, of our ideas into practice on the battlefield. 
Encouraged by this success, he attempted to initiate a close combat reform program for all the ground services when he assumed command of Joint Forces Command in 2009. At that time, I was under contract with General Mattis to assist in getting his so-called National Program for Small Unit Excellence, or NIPSU, off the ground. The effort started well, and it was brilliant for its time, but soon atrophied when General Mattis left to command CENTCOM. So after 14 years, we remain committed to the same objectives with the Close Combat Lethality Task Force. Why have we been dedicated to this enterprise for so long? You've heard this before, but the answer comes down to three numbers. 90, 4, and 1. 90, 4, and 1. 90 percent of those who die from enemy action are infantrymen. Not soldiers and Marines, but infantry. They constitute 4% of active duty uniform personnel and receive just 1% of the DOD budget for training and equipping. Such a small investment in close combat is difficult to believe, given the fact that from Iwo Jima to Niger, Dead Americans are our most vulnerable center of gravity. And our enemies know it. So wouldn't it make sense to do everything we possibly can to keep alive those most likely to die? The task force objective is to achieve overmatch in the close fight. We already achieve overmatch at sea and in the air. Our last major sea engagement was in the year I was born, 1944, Leyte Gulf. The last time we were seriously contested in air-to-air -air combat was in 1972, during the Christmas bombing offensive over North Vietnam. The last time close combat soldiers died, what time is it? October, recall the four special operating soldiers who died in Niger. My point is that small close combat units are the forces we employ every day. It's in this very close combat where our, where our, our forces engage what the secretary likes to call intimate killing. And yet this is the only place on the battlefield today where we risk a fair fight. That's why our enemies seek to kill us where he has the greatest chance of success, and that's on the ground. Putting emotionalism aside for a moment, there's a practical reason this initiative is so timely and important to American security. In a word, the dynamics of ground warfare are changing. The proliferation of precision is continually making the battlefield more distributed and more dispersed. Armies are increasingly relying on high quality close combat units to accomplish combat tasks formerly performed by much, much larger units in the past. The revolution in microelectronics has allowed weapons to become lighter and smaller. Now close combat units can carry with them the means to kill fighting vehicles, shoot down high-performance aircraft, and perform their own aerial reconnaissance using drones, and call for an enormous lethal panoply of deadly supporting fires using a soldier's cell phone and an app. We see this phenomenon around us everywhere today. We know about the superhuman exploits of our elite special forces operators, but our enemies get it as well. Mr. Putin employs his, quote, little green men, essentially elite infantrymen, as a remarkably effective and economical means for achieving his diabolical strategic ends. In a word, high-quality soldiers and Marines 
rather than mountains of metal are the keys to future victories. Thanks to OSD CAPE's extraordinary effort, we've identified $2.5 billion to invest in cutting-edge technologies that promise to improve the fighting effectiveness of our close combat units. But as many of you in this room know, what counts even more at the tactical level of war is what you put in the soldier, not what you put on the soldier. To that end, Mr. Wilkie's task force is focused, focusing on achieving overmatch with the intangibles, what the Army calls the human domain. For example, we spend many millions training pilots to achieve overmatch in very sophisticated simulators. The Secretary wants to do the same for small units. He told us to exploit training technologies such that, quote, the soldier fights 25 battles before the real battle begins. Think of a small unit top gun, to coin a phrase. So in keeping with the Secretary's intent, we plan to devote next of the, most of the next two phases of our enterprise to intangibles, such as unit manning, talent management, recruiting, selection, and most importantly, training. Mr. Wilkie and I, recognize the importance of all aspects of defense reform. But we support the Secretary's contention that reform of our ground forces at the tactical level offers the greatest potential increase in fighting effectiveness for the lowest price in the shortest time. So that completes my remarks, Mr. Wilkie. Well, thank you, General. Uh, I've had the privilege off and on of watching General Scales, and he's going to hate me for saying this, since I was about this tall. Um, and he is not only a scholar, but a gentleman. Uh, General McQuiston, thank you very much, and thank you to AUSA. I have to put in a shameless plug. Uh, I am a former sailor and a current airman, but I am a member of the Braxton Bragg chapter of the AUSA. And I do that for one reason. Um, I am, in my own small way, through AUSA, honoring the men on my side of the family and on my wife's side of the family who served with great distinction in the All-American Division going back to the days of Sergeant York. And, and hailing from southeastern North Carolina, I was taught that one of the most important roads in America is North Carolina Highway 24. That is the road that connects 40% of the United States Marine Corps in the eastern part of our state to the place General Scales and my father referred to as the hub of the universe, Fort Bragg. If America is called to action, chances are that Marines from eastern North Carolina and paratroopers from Fort Bragg will be the tip of the spear. And this initiative is about them, but it's also about their comrades at Camp Geiger, Fort Hood, Fort Benning, Okinawa, and Pendleton, and anywhere America is preparing her forces for the ground fight. Our new national defense strategy moves America away from conflicts that have consumed us for the last 17 years, and it looks once again to the place where Teddy Roosevelt pointed us, the Pacific, and it resets our deterrence in Europe. It also reminds us, as General Scales pointed out, that in spite of the magnificence of our special operators, we have forgotten basic military lessons. Churchill's most consistently successful general, Bill Slim, understood the trap in relying too heavily on special forces, and he had cut his teeth, as General Scales knows, as a commander of Gurkhas, and he had to deal on a daily basis with Ord Wingate's Chindits. Slim noted in his drive across Burma with the 14th Army that armies do not win wars by means of a few bodies of special super soldiers, but by the quality of their standard units. I, I said at my confirmation hearing 
and I haven't had a confirmation hearing yet on the VA, so don't, don't, don't count me in that world yet, um, that this town often gets wrapped up, wrapped around the axle about the new carrier or the new fighter. We have a nuclear posture review. We have sea power reviews. And now we are debating how we achieve supremacy in cyber and space, but nothing about the tip of the spear. Because of our nation's historic technical restlessness, we are constantly looking for the silver bullet to somehow change the nature of warfare. And I would argue, as General Scales has more eloquently in the last few years, that a look at history going back to Troy calls into question whether a technical panacea will ever emerge to change the grim facts of ground combat. Success relies not only on technical superiority, but more importantly, on the human dimension. As Secretary Mattis reminds us, there is nothing more important than focusing our energies now on developing and nurturing the unique capabilities of human performance. That means bringing fresh vigor, renewing our sense of urgency, and enhancing the lethality of our frontline Army and Marine Corps infantry units, hence the need for the Close Combat Task Force. The Secretary also prosaically said that this effort is about whether American democracy can prevail in the future. As he noted last year, our system does not have a God-given right to succeed. The history of the last 76 years is replete with examples of battles and units where our inability to fully train cohesive and potent ground combat forces cost America dearly. Kasserine, the Bulge, Task Force Smith, the AmeriCal Division, just to name a few. Today, our soldiers and Marines are the 21st century manifestation of the all-volunteer total force envisioned by the late Army Chief of Staff, Creighton Abrams. Those young Americans sign on to defend the American experiment. They then volunteer a second time, this time for the infantry, where America takes 90% of her battlefield casualties. It is for those brave volunteers who put their lives on the line again and again that we finally say, as General Scales said, no more fair fights. The enemy we face today is organized, adaptive, and well-armed. Ask the IDF what happened in 2006 when they encountered sophisticated kill zones and the potent effects of combined arms in their fight against Hezbollah. Ultimately, the IDF, as it always does, adapted and overcame, but only after paying a heavy price. This task force will aim to end that type of combat learning curve. When Secretary Mattis commanded the 1st Marine Division a few years ago, the same division that Alexander Vandergriff led to victory at Guadalcanal, he noted that although the equipment was different between his time and General Vandergriff's, the training was basically the same. And the secretary tells us that is no longer acceptable. At the end of the day, what we do here will lay the groundwork to overmatch every enemy. Anything short of that will have failed those exceptional young people who carry our future on their shoulders. We begin with several basic questions, and these inform our lines of effort. How do we select the right people? How do we retain the fighters we develop? How do we judge fitness? How do we provide the best nutrition regimen for all of our troops? How do we employ the best in cognitive and social sciences to create more lethal infantry teams? How do we develop sufficient cultural acuity so that our troops can thrive and protect themselves in any environment? We don't just want them to thrive we want them to fit in. And finally, do we understand, as do our greatest athletic leaders, that success comes with constant repetition and training? Now, there are several things we can do to begin to address these questions. For example, the personnel system that existed when my father was commissioned two months before the inauguration of John Kennedy is still in place preventing our young NCOs and young infantry officers from staying together longer, 
and creating the cohesion that history tells us is essential for survival on the battlefield. We can work with Congress to address that, keeping units together longer, creating the team muscle memory necessary for success. Also, through workforce rationalization, we can work to ensure soldiers are spending their time training for the fight and not siphoned off with ancillary duties that can best be performed by others. That brings me to another point that General Scales raised, and I will reemphasize it. Every plane and ship we purchase comes with sophisticated simulators to train personnel to overcome every conceivable contingency. We would not buy a plane or a ship that wasn't packaged along with that technology. But we don't do that for our ground forces. Why not build those state-of-the-art simulators with the sights, sounds, and smells for any exigency imaginable to comprehensively prepare our troops before the first shot is fired. This provides the repetition to make those vital synapses click faster. We have the technology to do this, and we need to put it in practice. Combine those training simulators with more rotations at Fort Irwin, 29 Palms and Fort Polk, and you lay the ground for our forces to engage in what the Secretary has said is those 25 bloodless battles before the first shot is fired. The decisions we make will put any enemy on notice that the day they challenge America will be both their worst day and with acknowledgement to Cornelius Ryan, their longest day. We are not starting from scratch. The Army and the Marine Corps have robust close combat reviews in place, and there is no reason why we cannot develop procedures for transferring the lessons learned from our special forces to our conventional operators. The Pentagon's Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation Office, CAPE, has given us a head start as well. They did extensive research to validate the theories put forth by General Scales in his close combat studies. They spent $2.4 billion for such items as small arms, precision tactical weapons, soldier protection systems, and tactical unmanned systems. Last month, CAPE handed over responsibilities for the Lethality Task Force to the Office of Personnel and Readiness. So why PNR? Since Secretary Mattis was sworn in, he breathed new life into the readiness portion of the portfolio I share with so many dedicated patriots at the Pentagon. We are no longer just an oversight office, but we now have responsibility to implement change across the department. Although the Army and Marine Corps share basic missions, they have different organizational structures and doctrine. It will be PNR's responsibility to convey the Secretary's wishes, provide resources, and iron out any differences that may exist between the two services. I will chair the Executive Committee. Lieutenant General Stacy Clarity will chair the Senior Steering Group, and Lieutenant Colonel Joe Latois will be the Director and Principal Advisor to both the Secretary and to me. The task force will be jointly manned by the services, joint staff, SOCOM and OSD, officers as well as NCOs. And I think more importantly, because what is hardest to explain to those around that this really is an art and not a science. The task force will be augmented by distinguished experts like General Scales and General Paul Van Riper and senior combat leaders from allied nations who will provide in-depth guidance on leadership, tactics, culture, behavior, weapons, and training. So what is the measure of success? As we have said, it is no more fair fights. The overmatch of any hostile force and the development of the leaders as adaptive player coaches who know themselves, who take responsibility for themselves, and who coach their soldiers and Marines to be at the top of their game in any environment against any enemy. These player coaches will become the building blocks who infuse culture with larger and larger units as they move forward in their careers. We must leave generational changes behind or we have failed. There is one warning. 
There are no short courts. Some cynics will say, what good does training small units do in the world when our own national security strategy says we must prepare for the potential great power threats from Russia and China, and at the same time, continue to be wary of Iran and North Korea? I will answer that in Secretary Mattis's words. He described a young decorated Marine corporal, a veteran of Vietnam, who stood in front of then officer candidate Mattis's OCS platoon at the 8th and I Parade in 1969. This young Marine told those future Marine officers, you exist to fight and fight well and protect our country. If you can't do the small things perfectly, you can't do the big things even halfway well enough. I could not have said that any better. And once again, I want to thank AUSA, General Scales, and my colleagues from the Pentagon and those who support this great institution for being here today and starting off with us on what will be one of the most important missions that I think any of us will have ever undertaken. So thank you very much and take care. would like to ask a question. Okay. Come on. Uh, hi. Uh, this is uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. A uh, question for both of you. I understand the immediate focus is on training, but I was hoping you could uh, talk a little more about uh, what you're looking at in terms of new weaponry for infantrymen. I'll let you handle that. Uh, that's a great question. Hi, Jeff. It's good to see you. Um, well, um, one of the interesting things about our small arms community is uh, how ancient our weapons that our soldiers and Marines carry into combat today, how ancient they are. Just think about this. Does anyone know when the M2 machine gun was first fired? Anybody know? I'm a historian, so this is unfair. Uh, 1919, and yet it's still the most prolific machine gun in, uh, in the American military. Uh, the M16, M4, AR-15 series of automatic rifles go back to 1955, uh, and I could go on and on. The bottom line is that the, the secretary, going back to his days as a battalion commander, saw the inadequacies of many of our close combat weapons, and he started to emphasize the importance of a new family of weapons of all stripes. Uh, automatic rifle, a new, machi new machine guns, and so forth. But he's also dedicated to the idea of infusing the precision revolution and the mic revolution in microcircuitry down to the smallest level so that the squad can have precision weapons and can exploit the, micro, the revolution in microcircuitry to carry along weapons and capabilities that used to exist at company, battalion, and even brigade level during my generation of service. So this is a transformative effort, and we're well on our way to doing that. The Army is just committed to a next generation rifle, and we're well on the way to introducing a new pistol and hopefully soon uh, new automatic weapons and new precision guided weapons at the squad level. But I'd like to emphasize what Mr. Wilkie said. Very important, Jeff. Weapons are important, but we believe that some percentage greater than half, maybe 60%, maybe 70% of the improvement in small units in our ability to achieve overmatch is more with the human dimension than it is with the technology of weapon systems. That includes training, manning, personnel policy, selection, recruiting, all those things. The real transformation, we believe, is going to be in that area. I, I'm going to add to the, the last comment that the general made. In my confirmation hearing last year, I laid out several things that, 
and I mentioned briefly in the comments, that were in place when my father was commissioned into the field artillery. We have PCS policies that are a manifestation of uh, 19th century army ways of doing business. Um, the constant rotation was fine when we had a force of millions refreshed, and this also includes the 20-year upper out model, a force of millions constantly refreshed by hundreds of thousands of draftees, tens of thousands of ROTC graduates every year. Um, when my father was commissioned, to less than 9% of the force had families. Today, 70% do. I think we have to take a very deep dive with the Congress and look at the ways we can keep families in place on post, on the bases longer. And with that change in the family, the familial structure of our military, allow spouses to garner time, time to garner meaningful employment. So it is, there's a, I hate to use, it's an over, overused word about a holistic approaches to things. But it is also about that family component that is now the be all and end all when it comes to when it comes to military service. That will, those changes tie into our ability to maintain those co cohesive uh, units. And Jeff, let me just beat this horse one more time. Um, I have my good friend and classmate, John Dubia, uh, in the audience today. We both remember the Army of 1970 to 73, where 40% of the Army was Cat 4, where only 40% of the Army had a high school education, where 19% of the soldiers in Europe were addicted to hard drugs, where uh, 809 incidents of fratricide occurred between 1969 and, and uh, uh, 1973. My point is that, that, that quality is the most essential uh, uh, characteristic of our fighting force, and, and quality has to has to pervade into the close combat force as well. The days of Willie and Joe in World War II are over. And the number one essential quality, the, 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 the glass ball that can't be broken here, is to ensure that uh, the soldiers that serve in the close combat arms are absolutely of the highest quality. And I think Mr. Wilk and I both agree that that's, that needs, needs to be job one highest quality soldiers and Marines, and enough of them to do the mission. Sir, I'd, I'd want to follow up with your comments on readiness. Uh, I, th I think what I'm hearing is that we need a better definition of what we want down there at those small units that are doing close combat, and having been an infantryman and written a lot of readiness reports, you know, we, we typically count strength, numbers, NCOs, and things that are countable. Uh, what, do you, what do you see going forward in terms of a way of describing the force that we want down at that level and how we're going to measure it? And frankly, if it doesn't get measured and reported and come up the chain, it's going to fall in line behind the tank crews and everybody else who has real numbers and table eights and things you can measure and put in there for, uh, for the bean counters. Um, thanks, Jim. What a great question. Um, uh, I think clearly at the small unit level, the readiness reporting system fails us. One of the things that Secretary Mattis most frustrated about is wasting soldiers and Marines time. And that's particularly true in infantry units who are oftentimes seen as a utility in fielders for right. post details. You know, if your generator mechanic is on a post detail, your generators don't get fixed. And so the, 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 the tendency is to give that, those missions to close combat soldiers. So what I think the secretary wants to do is to have a measurement that measures true individual small unit readiness beyond just manning. One suggestion we're looking at is to have in the readiness reporting system a uh, accountable, measurable system of determining qualifications. Another is to have a measured system for accounting for soldiers and Marines' time during the duty week, perhaps a percentage of hours during the week that a soldiers are in the field uh, rather than doing post details. 
We're looking at many different things. But Jim, you're 100% right. When, you're when your unit status report is assembled at division headquarters, what happens uh, at platoon and below somehow gets lost in the wash. Yeah, I, I want to follow up on that, and I mentioned it, I mentioned it earlier. Um, PNR is doing a cross-service assessment as to how we report readiness. And um, without going into to too much depth, um, the way we have gauged our ability to respond to threats um, has, has been uh, uneven at best because we never start with the, fir the, the proper question, ready for what? Uh, but in addition to that, we have to, and I mentioned getting in line with the Congress, um, start looking at a real workforce rationalization plan for the Army and the Marine Corps. So as General Scales says, those young, I don't use Fort Bragg, those young infantrymen are not, you know, manning the gates, they're not manning the, the gym, they're not doing ancillary duties um, that take them away from their day-to-day -day tasks. And that's, that's something that we need to do for the entire department, but it's particularly true in this case. Courtney McBride with Inside the Army. Uh, Two-part question. How frequently does the task force meet and do you have sort of um, timelines for uh, establishing various objectives? Um, and then additionally, how do you ensure that the, the initiative lasts beyond, say, the current FIDIP? Um, yeah. You know, there have been other, other efforts such as empowering the squad that seem to have kind of fallen by the wayside. So how do you, how do you preserve the effort? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that in a couple of ways. First of all, um, I take Secretary Mattis uh, at his word and to heart that this is the effort that he wants to leave behind uh, no matter how long he serves as Secretary of Defense. That's a pretty powerful foundational statement. Um, I've already begun evangelizing this concept with the Congress. Uh, I think public relations is a vital part of the effort. Uh, met today with uh, several United States senators, also uh, last I mean, Monday with staffs. Um, right now we don't need anything from them in that we have fulfilled Senator McCain's vision as ev evidenced by the last NDAA of creating cross-functional teams that can cut through bureaucracy, cut across service lines and create organizations that can can address a specific problem. So right now, Joe Latois is in the final stages of putting together an organization that is comprised primarily of, of, of soldiers and Marines. Um, we'll provide an organ, a, a, a basic organization to carry out the agenda as we go forward. And that's how, how deep are you into that? Just so I'd say we're about 80% uh, on the manning piece. Yeah. And actually, the second OCD developed today, uh, developed a campaign plan for our practice for our own So that's the first step. Uh, I think the second step has already been taken care of. The Secretary of Defense has called in the Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of the Navy and of course the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and said this is, this is my priority. And um, those are pretty clear instructions from him. And um, we're gonna do our best to make sure that we fulfill his vision. And having been in this town long enough, um, I, am, I am confident that with the people working on this and with the strength of the Secretary of Defense that this will produce tangible results for the ground forces. If, if I could just echo what the Secretary is saying, uh, remember at the tactical level of warfare, the flash to bang time for transformation is much, much shorter than in other services and in other dimensions. It may take 
25 years to design and build and, and field a new tank or a new missile or a new fighter plane. But in this dimension, we can see results in months, certainly not more than a few years. Uh, many of the things that the Secretary is talking about can be accomplished with a stroke of a pen, particularly as it relates to some of the intangibles that we spoke about. So I believe, we believe, and the Secretary believes, the surest way to get the most bang for the buck in the shortest possible time with tangible results on the battlefield is at the tactical level of war. And that's why he's so enthused about leading his transformational efforts at the tactical level where results are most apparent. Hello, gentlemen. My name is Scott Padgett. I'm the Director for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning for IBM Corporation, and retired Rangers lead the way. Cool. Um, you know, the Chinese and the Russians are making great advances in artificial intelligence, and it's a continuing, growing, accelerated threat. And we believe, I'm sitting here with my old Ranger instructor here, we believe it's going to have direct impact at the tactical level with the basic infantry men or women. So uh, could you share what or if any artificial intelligence machine learning requirements that you're developing and how industry can help leverage what we have commercially? Well, I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to answer that question. Um, my first day working in the United States Senate, I was ushered into um, the office of Jesse Helms. Uh, we both went to Wake Forest. And he was reading my um, Wake Forest resume. And he said, he sort of talked like Bear Bryant. And he said, son, that is a, that is a magnificent Wake Forest resume. Majored in politics and classical language. You are qualified to have long conversations with 90-year-old priests and be a tour guide in Rome. <laughs> Uh, that's the reason I won't answer your artificial intelligence question, but I'll leave it to. Yeah. Uh, to, so Mr. Uh, Wilkie yeah. leaves it to a historian. That's Boy, right. that's a real softball. Okay. Uh, let me try to answer uh, your question as a historian, not a technologist. About every two or three generations, a technology intercedes to fundamentally change the dynamics of the battlefield. We call these epochal shifts. Uh, the invention of gunpowder, uh, uh, the invention of uh, or the application of the radio and internal combustion engine uh, to ground combat, the introduction of the first precision revolution with the machine gun in particular. And these fundamentally shift the dynamics of warfare. I'm not trying to patronize you, but I think that AI and the attended applications of AI to the battlefield are going, to, are going to result in that apocryphal shift. And, it, and the, the interesting thing about AI is it applies to many different elements of, of this equation rather than just a machine. For instance, uh, the Army must be able to create synthetic environments where we can, to use Mr. Wilkie's term, we can, we can have repetition and variation and stress applied to training small units. That can only be done, I believe, with the application of AI. Otherwise, you can't get variation uh, at that level of warfare. I think that uh, drones that can think on their own and, and intrude into an enemy space and yet be small enough about the size of this water bottle can only be built with AI and the attendant technologies. So I think a tectonic shift in warfare, the next epochal shift, Oh, and the final thing I'll mention to you is what AI allows is micro-miniaturization of all of these capabilities. An air defense unit would take eight or nine acres back when I first came in the Army, and now we can put much of it on the shoulders of an infantryman. And AI allows, uh, infuses the new weapons with the ability not only to be more flexible, but to be small enough to be integral to a small unit. So yes, I think uh, you at IBM and others in the room who have ideas about AI, as it applies to tactical warfare, are most welcome to join. Uh, I'm going to take speaker's privilege and, and 
go back to something that I didn't say in, um, in my remarks, and it, 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 I, I should not have left it out. I, I quoted Bill Slim and talked about an over-reliance on, on, on special operations forces. Um, now let me take a step back. I think in, the, in this task force we have uh, a robust interaction with, with MARSOC, with USASOC, with, with JSOC. Um, the lessons learned by our special operators, our special operations community, in my view, can be transposed to larger units. Training, nutrition, recovery times for injuries, um, the cultural uh, programs that special operators go through as part of their fundamental training. There is absolutely no reason why those lessons cannot be used for our, what Slim called, standard infantry units. Um, and we would be a disservice to them by not using of those lessons learned. I, um, I was discussing this um, actually earlier today with um, Senator McCain's staff because several of them are going to um, a Special Forces Medical Training Brigade at, um, at Fort Bragg, which was actually my, the first commander was my uh, godfather, a guy named Dick Sutton, Doc Sutton. And I told him, you're going to be shocked because not only will you see uh, the medics from the SEALs and what have you, but when you go into the gymnasiums and the rehabilitative uh, facilities that the special operations community has, you're going to watch people walking around in polo shirts with the National Hockey League emblem on their shirts or Major League Baseball or the NBA. What we've been able to do for those soldiers and Marines is bring in the best talent when it comes to physical training. Not only to get them in the best physical shape possible, but also to quicken the recovery time when they are injured. And it is a fascinating thing. There is not an NFL team that has the resources that are sitting down in places like Fort Bragg and Coronado. Um, but in my mind, and I, I think the general agrees, there's no reason that those lessons and those procedures cannot be used for larger, larger Amen. formations. If, if I could just use the tagline, um, we're not talking about a, this, this enterprise is not about a service. It's about a function that cuts across service lines. And, and that's what the Secretary and I are really trying to emphasize. This isn't about soft special operating forces versus conventional forces, Army and Marine. We see this more as a continuum. And we're trying to bleed together uh, uh, expertise all the way across the spectrum of land combat to, to, to raise the level of competence across the board. We think that's very important. And one more point. The sciences are not just AI. They're huge advances in things like neuroscience. One of the things we're so interested in is intuition and the, the role of intuition that plays in small unit decision making and leadership. And we've just begin, begun to scratch the surface on understanding the human brain and how the human brain uh, 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 compels the soldier to act properly uh, when, he comes under uh, when he comes under enemy fire. And the final point, uh, to the Secretary's point, you, people say, well, why are you doing this? It's so expensive. Well, let me tell you, I don't know what the figure is, but if, you, if, if we could save a soldier's life uh, by avoiding him becoming a serious casualty, uh, think how much money that saves the nation and how much, and how much uh, misery that soldier avoids by being dominant rather than just superior on the battlefield. This is vitally important to us. Thank you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Frank Rosinski, uh, pleasure to have you, and thank you for your comments. We welcome you very much. As a former infantryman and commander, it means a lot. Um, agree with you 100%, and I thank Secretary Mattis for moving out in this direction. We've been talking about this for a long, long time. Um, we do have, I, I came up in the Army in the 70s, and for the people that we have today, it's remarkable. 
uh, the type of infantrymen you have on the ground are the best in the world. Our equipment is the best in the world. Yes, you could always get a better rifle, but the AK-47 has been around for a long time, and it still puts out a pretty lethal round. Um, it is all about training, and it is all about readiness, and that's the part that's been going downhill. Um, we have, as a former commander, we have so many issues about losing land, about losing resources, about losing time, about losing money to train. Uh, it's the most important and critical event. Training to combat realism is the best thing you can do for a soldier or Marine. We're not there. We have two, three combat training centers and the throughput for a brigade combat team commander maybe once in his entire career. Uh, so commanders have to do home station training to standard with the best there is. What's gonna be different with what you're doing than what people have said they were going to do for years and years and years about preserving the land, the resources, the time, and the money to give commanders the opportunity to train. It appears like every um, endangered species on the planet migrates to army posts, <laughs> and we're losing more and more land to train every single day. How are we going to, and there's a lot of people fighting us, how are you going to help us? So you've encountered the red cockaded woodpecker. Everywhere I've been on yes. every post in the army. Yeah. Well, let me... Uh, my father got a congressional investigation for doing something to the red yeah, cockaded so woodpecker. Red cockaded right. woodpecker. Um, by the way, the last time I was, <laughs> I was at Camp Lejeune. 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 Um, poor, poor Anthony's statue. There was a red cockaded woodpecker on General Lejeune's head, <laughs> and I thought that was that was sacrilegious. Um, let me tell you what we can't use as an excuse anymore. And Secretary Mattis has emphasized this with all of us in the Department of Defense. The United States Congress just passed legislation that gives the Department of Defense about $700 billion. Everything that the Secretary of Defense asked for has been given to him. And it is incumbent upon us to convince the representatives of the people that we are spending that wisely. We have the resources to begin the long road of changing our focus as the national defense strategy tells us to change, or national security strategy first, toward the Pacific, deterrence in Europe, what have you. Um, there are a number of issues that uh, impact the way we train, um, but I think we have to be more creative in getting around them. For instance, in North Carolina, um, I was deeply involved in getting land uh, that was adjacent to Lejeune, a part of Lejeune, a part of Fort Bragg, off of our roles to protect endangered species in exchange for land that we could use that didn't have those problems. Yeah. That's, that's an example. We have to be, uh, we have to be more creative. Um, the throughputs, absolutely. We do have to take better advantage of training on home station and doing more of it. It costs 25% of what it costs to send somebody to 29 Palms. We, we can't the secretary will not tolerate the woe is me approach. Um, but the other side of this, and, and you mentioned it, is what the general first talked about, and that is using technology to create environments at Benning, at Hood, at Bragg, at Lejeune, Pendleton, that permit us to train our small units in oppressive conditions, um, there's a, the, the, the simulator at Camp Pendleton. I will not name the spouse of one of the Joint Chiefs. She went through it to observe, and she ended up in the hospital because the sights and sounds and smells were so realistic. Uh, she's fine. She's fine. But we have the technology to do those things and augment traditional forms of training through the use of technology to enhance the skills of 
of, of, our, of our ground combat forces. But I can tell you the Secretary of Defense will not allow us to say to the public, right now we need more money because we have been given that trust by the Congress. Uh, just real quick, I, I, uh, I remember when I was at Bragg and the yellow, yellow cockaded woodpecker was invading all of our firing points. I mean, they were shutting them down one by one until the day that uh, uh, the post environmental officer said that the woodpecker was in pine trees right next to the NCO club. Uh, that led to a revolt among the NCOs at Fort Bragg, and, we pu and they managed to push back. Um, let me just use a quote uh, and give you a challenge. The Secretary said, I want soldiers and Marines to fight 25 bloodless battles before the first battle begins. My good friend Joe Latois over here did the math, back of the beer math, as we call it, on the back of an envelope. And what that equates to is, for the active force alone, listen to this number now, 23,000 immersions a year. 23,000 immersions a year. Uh, using a, a simulator like the tomato factory at, uh, at Camp Pendleton that the secretary alluded to. I'd like those in this room to think for a moment tonight when you go home, how do I, given the resources and the technologies we have today, uh, give soldiers and Marines 25 bloodless battles, mostly in home station and garrisons? How do I get that 23,000 figure? If you could do that, uh, we can change the world. 23,000 bloodless battles a year. Ridiculous. I've had some dealings with training for the Navy, for SOCOM uh, in the past. And one of the things that I have always found is that, first of all, the trainers generally say, our schedules are absolutely full. We can't possibly squeeze another course into the whole curriculum. I mean, if we squeeze something else in, for instance, the notion of cultural acuity, that takes time. And actually putting in a course like that means that, according to them, that they have to remove something from their curriculum in order to fit it in. The second thing is that frequently I've heard, oh, we can't possibly do that. We've never done that before. How would we begin? Where do we start? And so nothing does get done. And so I was just wondering, because I really like the tack you're taking. I think it's absolutely brilliant. How, how are you planning to overcome some of that inertia, some of those problems in terms of both the, the time and the trainer's mindset? Yeah. Well, let me give you the precursor to this for me. And it happened in November uh, when I was um, sworn in. Uh, the Secretary of Defense looked at me and said, we are weighing our Marines and soldiers down with mandatory training um, on subjects that range from hygiene um, to um, how you drive a car. I'm not going to, uh, I could be more eloquent, but but let's just focus on the, the number of things we were requiring our troops to do. Um, we tasked the Army, the Navy Department, the Air Force, the service secretaries are in total agreement with you, and they're cutting down the number of mandatory courses that all of our troops, whether they're in the infantry or not, have to undergo. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, as a reservist, I mean, how many, uh, I, when I go on reserve duty for my two-week period, I spend the first four and a half days doing mandatory training. I deprive the United States government and the people of four and a half days when I should be doing what I am tasked to do for them. And yet that training is the same training that I had the year before and the year before that. So we have come a long way in changing that part of the culture, which then leads to freeing up more time to do the important things. The second part of that is what PNR is 
is doing on workforce rationalization. Um, we, we have to return soldiers and Marines to soldiers and Marine duty. And we have a massive civilian force. I think it's 750,000 people. Now they do a lot of things, um, but our soldiers and Marines should not be doing those things. The other thing we have to look for in terms of rationalization, and I'm not casting aspersions on any combatant commander or what have you, I know that there is a drive to broaden the experiences of a lot of people. I get that. But uh, I'll just use the Air Force as an example, um, but it's illustrative. Air Force has a serious pilot retention problem or uh, getting pilots behind the, the stick. Well, then they send pilots off to intel billets, to logistics billets, to, to fill out our combatant command orders of battle. Um, I think if I were to ask any pilot what he'd rather be doing, he would tell you I joined the force to fly a military aircraft. So we have to do a serious dive on several levels. We're working on getting rid of a lot of that mandatory training. Um, we are working with the combatant commanders to rationalize the need for certain types of MOSs. Um, and, and I think that is, that is part of this continuum that General Scales talked about in, in addressing how we we build out this, this um, new way of looking at close combat. And it, some of those lessons apply across the department. Uh, I'll just, I agree completely, uh, Chris, and if I could just add one more aspect of it. When you look at what makes armies perform, or all combat forces perform brilliantly, oftentimes it's competition. Why do units do so well at NTC? Well, because they have a you bet your, you bet your butt exercise at the, end of the, at the end of the year, and they focus on doing well at NTC. The same with Top Gun uh, and Red Flag. They know that they're going to be uh, evaluated, and they're going to be held accountable, and therefore they train more intensively, and they tend to shed a lot of this stuff that you talked about because of the necessity of performing well. I think that same rule can be applied to small units. If there was an attributable standard that was extremely high, say at the tier one level of performance as a goal, and you, and you evaluated close combat senior leaders on their ability to reach that goal, I think you'd find a lot of this fluff disappear from the training schedule if they knew there was an attributable event at the end of the year. Gentlemen, again, I'd like to add my thanks for your uh, commitment to this effort and making our military more lethal and, and uh, stronger. Um, one of the things that Frank talked about uh, was the shortage of time, and you've alluded to that as you talked about training. I have long concluded that most of the challenges that our military faces today comes back to it ain't big enough. We don't have sufficient end strength, I don't think, in any of the services, and that requires demands on soldiers and Marines time to do the, these other things. How does that factor into your consideration, and are you going to be able to address, first of all, do you share that conclusion, and how are you factor that in to enable you to well, succeed in this effort. Yeah, I mean, I'll just go back to what I said about workforce rationalization. Um, it is imperative and it is incumbent upon us to make sure Marines do what Marines are supposed to do. And um, I know the Corps is very deep into um, looking at what kind of ancillary duties take away from that Marine's ability to carry the fight. Um, and I, I could actually apply that to all of the services when it comes to the, to the tip of the spear for each of them. Uh, you're right, time is of the essence, but we have to do a much better job of, of man managing the force. 
and I'll just uh, end this uh, with the observation, number one, I agree with you, but I'd also argue that the workload is maldistributed. Yeah. Uh, that we rely so much on our tier one uh, 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 special operating forces to do so many of the missions that could be apportioned perhaps a little bit more generously if we had more resources applied to our top end conventional forces. I mean, but, but here's the thing. Here's, here's another number to take away from today. All, everything you've talked about and that we've talked about in the close combat arena, global commitments, uh, and the force we're talking about for the active force is 43,000. That's half the seats in Giant Stadium. So we're dealing with a very, very small number. And uh, one of my hopes is that we'll be able in the future to get to your question, to overman these forces. When I was in Vietnam, a 750-man infantry battalion would have a foxhole strength just north of 400. Um, the average squad in Vietnam on patrol was about five or six. That's just not acceptable for the wars we're fighting in the future. It completely obviates all of the work we do in structuring units to be effective in the field. So. Let's do a better job of distributing the force we have, and let's do a better job of manning those units that we have so they don't go into combat shorthanded. I will just note that in addition to all of you here today, we've had more than 100 sites connected virtually to hear this talk. Thank you, Mr. Wilkie and General Scales for the informative remarks and the critical work that your task force has undertaken. Please know that you have our full support as you continue the work. We invite all of you to participate in our up their upcoming forums, including our Rogers Strategic Forum on May 8th with the Army Surgeon General Nadia West. We've included a card with information on that event, but you can find information on all of our events at our website at ausa.org. We do thank you all for attending. Please have a great rest of the day.